Cool. So what we will do is, I think we will get ourselves started. Um, so welcome everybody who has come into this in conversation with, which is with Andrew and Cedric. Before we start, I was going to say I'll give myself a little introduction and then Andrew and Cedric can give themselves an introduction because they will do a lot better than probably what I would do for them. So my name is Lauren Webster. I work for the Wellcome Centre of Anti-Infective Research and I am the Scientific and Pedagogy Lead for the training programme. Today we have two awesome guests. We've got ourselves Andrew Matewa and Cedric Graben. And actual fact, I think, Andrew, why don't you introduce yourself first to the audience? Thank you, Lauren. Um, my name is Andrew Mtewa, as Lauren has already stated. I am from Malawi and I work uh, with the Malawi University of Science and Technology in Malawi. I am a medicinal chemist. Um, so, yeah, basically that's all I can say for now. It was very nice introduction. Thank you, Andrew. Cedric, for you? So, as Lauren, first of all, good afternoon to everybody. Or, well, good afternoon. Even in Brazil, is good morning. So it's good. It's half. It's past noon. So good afternoon to everybody. My name is Cedric Grabin. I was born in Brazil. I lived the last forty years in the country. I in the uh, while as well, I was living in Brazil. I worked as a professor and researcher of organic and medicinal chemistry in a public university in the state of Rio de Janeiro. But since last February, I am working at the Wellcome Center for Anti-Infective Research. Under Lauren's guidance, she is the, the scientific lead and pedagog pedagogy lead. I am the trainer, so whatever she tells me to teach, I am teaching to the trainees and everybody that uses our courses. And so, and now I'm getting used to this Scottish winter. That seems lovely so far. <laughs> yeah, Andrew knows a little bit about the Scottish winter. Bless him. <laughs> <laughs> lovely. Uh, it's lovely. He says it through gritted teeth. <laughs> so guys, so for everybody that's on the chat, um, I just want to make you all aware that the chat is open. So please feel free to post any questions that you have for our researchers and I will do my very best to speak them out loud to uh, to them both. So it's open throughout, so post anything you uh, would like answered. So today's topic, what we're going to do is, is that we've got two researchers who work in the field of drug discovery, but from two very different settings. So as Andrew said, he is from Malawi and Cedric, okay, now he's in Scotland, but he spent a large portion of his time back in Brazil. So he still classifies himself as Brazilian. <laughs> so. What we're going to do today is is to get a feeling for what do these scientists do and what are the challenges that they face doing drug discovery and how similar could could these ideas be? So, Andrew, why don't you start us off? You know, what what does your everyday workings look like um, at the uni? Yeah, well, so <clears throat> my everyday work is um, really more or less like a routine. Uh, so basically, I uh, I am a lecturer in the university. I teach chemistry. So most of my work, or most of my day is taken up by maybe preparing for classes, uh, meeting students, uh, teaching, delivering modules, maybe marking. Uh, it's not an everyday thing, but it's something that is um, always uh, considered in my everyday work. Um, however, part of my work also, uh, uh, concerns research. So research uh, is a very good portion of uh, what I do. Um, so my research is in traditional uh, medicine as well as uh, conventional medicine. It's in drug discovery in general. I'm a medicinal chemist, so my focus is mostly in the chemistry part because uh, you know in uh, drug discovery, you have to look at the chemistry part, the biology part, maybe pharmacy, and other allied maybe programs, uh, fields, professionals that contribute to that. But for me, I just look at um, uh, the, the chemistry part. So um, it's really um, not so easy, but generally, uh, because you just asked me about how my day usually is like, yeah, it's about thinking of teaching, thinking about students, thinking of research, going into the lab, 
um, working with our laboratory technicians and attendants, uh, and then uh, going into uh, meetings with our maybe heads of departments, deans. So generally, that's the picture that I have uh, in a day. Oh, cool. And I, I like how I would say there's a, a balance between both research and teaching, but there seems to be an awful lot more teaching there compared to the research. But Cedric, when you were in Brazil, how does how does that seem? Does that seem similar to what Andrew has discussed? Yes, because I also was working in a public university, so a mostly academic setting. That means a lot of administrative tasks, meetings and committees and evaluations, and teaching and research. But uh, unlike uh, Andrew, my research was more a synthetic organic chemistry, so I was not working with natural products per se, but more using uh, natural products as inspiration to synthesize uh, new organic compounds that we hopefully would find it in interesting to treat diseases such as malaria, uh, leishmaniasis, Chagas disease, uh, neglected tropical diseases that are m m very common in Brazil and also for some kind some kinds of cancer. But essentially it will be the same uh, a daily and weekly routine. So meetings and committees and classrooms, students and research and lots of things to do at the same time. Of course, trying to write some grants to get some money, to get some funding for research as well. When they appeared, we can check a, check a little um, a little bit more about that yeah. in, in further along. And yeah, so and why such. don't we just get started with, so Cedric, you had said that you are a synthetic chemist, so you go into the lab and you make uh, compounds to for a target or a particular disease or pathogen. Now, Andrew, you said you worked with traditional medicine. So how is that different from what, what Cedric's doing? Uh, so basically, um, the difference is um, in the source material. So the starting material that I have in my research, though still drug discovery, uh, the focus is on uh, natural products that are already in use in the communities. So, um, for example, much of um, Africa and most of um, Malawi, my country, uh, people use still use quite a lot of traditional uh, herbal medicines as a primary healthcare uh, solution to different diseases. They've been using that for uh, quite a number of years, maybe for, uh, for, for centuries. So, what we do is we are trying to, to take what is already in use, uh, what is known, and to, to begin now looking at what is not yet known, which could be of interest. And the interest could be maybe we could have something that we can develop a better drug from, or maybe what they are taking is somehow maybe not safe in other, uh, um, in other maybe perspectives. So that is the picture that we have. The difference with what Cedric is doing is uh, probably that um, he is looking at compounds that they have made, uh, maybe from uh, perhaps other natural products that, that, that they have found, but they are making new compounds uh, so that they can be tested and uh, come up with maybe some better drugs. Uh, so I think the difference may, uh, mostly is on the source material uh, that we are using. Yeah. And what, for instance, is the accessibility to you to to undertake synthesis you said yours stems from natural products and material that's already in circulation so how so you you aren't doing the synthetic side of things um do you see that as something that you could perhaps start to undertake for instance yes so synthetic to be honest, for a drug discoverer, you cannot do without it. You still need it at some point. So mostly the limits that we have are on maybe the resources for us to undertake synthetic research. But synthetic research is something that can uh, be more meaningful than probably what we mostly do. Um, I am saying that because I'm taking it from an angle um, where uh, 
if you're looking at traditional medicines, we can use them, but you find that maybe they are maybe too reactive to different targets that we are not even intending to, to target. So you could have maybe a particular disease, maybe headache, and you're taking some herbal material. It's okay, you can get well, but we are not so sure what else is happening besides healing the headache. So you find that some compounds in that are also reacting with other targets within the body, probably causing some other illnesses that were not there before, or maybe are bringing other challenges that were not foreseen. The other um, advantage of maybe going into synthetic research uh, is that the traditional medicines are going to give us a pool of uh, drug, possible drugs that we can develop further into. So we have quite a lot of, a lot of diseases in the country. Um, we, we are here, we, we might have some knowledge on how to address them. We might have knowledge that, okay, if I take this compound from the natural products, I can develop maybe 10 other compounds that can work on different diseases, which could be a plus. But because we don't have maybe those resources to, to enable us to undertake uh, synthetic research, we find that we lose quite a lot of opportunities. We just throw most of maybe potential compounds into the dustbin and then it ends there. So yeah, I would really say we need to work hand in hand. We can't ignore uh, synthetic research. Mm -hmm. And I would say as well that you had said that the work you do is not as meaningful. I wouldn't necessarily not as meaningful. I would say that there's there's advantages and disadvantages of both methods. So there is a place for, for natural products. Um, so Cedric, since you are then the synthetic chemist and you have gone on to synthesize further compounds, why, why don't you work with natural products? So Andrew stated why he doesn't work with synthetic compounds. Why don't you work with natural products then? Well, I worked with natural products in the past. So mostly uh, commercial natural products, using them as starting material for semi-synthesis. But then when I began to work with my, uh, my very own uh, research activities as a principal, principal investigator in Brazil, I wanted to work with something that, uh, how can I say that, that was something that was not very explored by a lot of other chemists in the countries. Because we uh, in Brazil, we have very uh, good number of research groups working with natural products, isolating, identifying, and trying to find biological activities for natural products, uh, either from from uh, uh, from uh, ground plants or from underwater organisms as well. And I, want, I wanted to work with um, more synthetic uh, work, not relying that much in a natural product as a starting material, and I was not the, the two experiences that I had were not that good working working with natural products. Not because natural products are bad, but my natural products, the ones that I worked in the U.S., not so good to work with. And also, I had another problem that is a problem mostly in several parts of the country. We don't have. Uh, I didn't had uh, a very good laboratory infrastructure to begin with. So I needed to work with synthetic methods of reactions that I could work in the laboratory that I had. So anything that was too dangerous, too explosive, or too smelly, I could not be using because I could not rely that my film hood would be able to just uh, pump out uh, any dangerous smells in the lab. And that happened once. When we, without knowing, we synthesized an isonitrile uh, into the film hood, and then I had to deal with very angry faces uh, in the hallway because isonitriles are nasty. In the loss of other words, so it was a lot, and uh, it was a mixture of opportunities and lack of infrastructure all coming together to yeah. guide me somehow. Yeah. So I was going to say, so both of you, you have very similar, you're, you're both very similar in, well, Cedric, you've just said that you have worked with natural products. Andrew, you do work with natural products. You vary slightly with the amount of synthetic feasibility that you've both managed to, to do. And so now we've established a similarity 
with both of you. You know, you are both working in drug discovery. You're both working with materials that you have. Some are natural products, some are from synthetic backgrounds. Now let's have a little wee focus on how do you differ? OK, and how do you differ either from yourselves or how you differ from like an institute, for instance, like the Welcome Centre? How are we different? So, for instance, um, Cedric, you mentioned the challenge about grants. So I would say give yourself maybe perhaps like a minute, a minute and a half for, for the grants. And then as Andrew's smiling in the background, he'll, he'll be ready to dive in at any point. Just dive in, Andrew, anytime you want. So, uh, of course, I gotta be fair, Brazilian situation regarding funding for science and technology, as bad as it is this year, is way, way better than several other developing countries in the world. I gotta need that. But we were way better in the past. Since 2015, there has been yearly and yearly consecutive cuts in in funding, which means that and the number of researchers increased from 2009 to 2015, which means that we had the double of researchers working with the the half or not half, uh, one fourth uh, of the, the the money that we had in 2015. In what means, in other words, a huge competition among researchers trying to grab some money to keep on funding, funding their labs. So in the end, most of the researchers were uh, suffering some for, for, uh, or experiencing lack of resources. And that was uh, what was happening with me in my laboratory and several other colleagues in my, my institution. So, so it's been like it, the lack of uh, reagents or lack of because of the grants and everything you just talked about the people but what about more like the infrastructure like the, the physical surroundings so that is so that means we had less money to buy reagents and supplies we had less money to fix any kind of broken equipment and if we try wanted to buy a new equipment or to reform a room so we could use uh, maybe to try to adapt a room to create a new lab. You don't even want to mention that. Because nobody has money to, to do any kind of uh, major works on construction. And I noticed as uh, well, Andrew yeah. is nodding yeah. his head and wanting to Not, say something yeah. there. Please um, go ahead, Andrew. Already, yes, already, um, Cedric, I, I have noted uh, the difference uh, that we have in the settings. Uh, for example, if you're um, uh, you look at the general picture in, in our country here, um, for us to get grants uh, within the country, uh, specific for drug discovery, is not so easy. Uh, I, I don't remember um, having come across a very, uh, a grant uh, in drug discovery in the country, maybe for the past maybe three years uh, or so. Um, so most of the grants that are found in our country uh, may be have to do with maybe social science research, maybe developmental uh, studies, uh, but for natural uh, science research, particularly in drug discovery, we we really don't have uh, that kind of um, an opportunity uh, in the country. So um, it takes maybe uh, effort of those uh, maybe teams in different universities to come together and maybe look around and uh, look at some some grants that are flying maybe from overseas uh, coming maybe into maybe the country or maybe uh, that are targeting the whole continent uh, then we go for them uh, and we try our luck sometimes we get them and uh, some other times uh, we don't get the opportunities so um, again looking at maybe an opportunity to use sometimes as researchers we can use our own money our own salaries maybe to buy some regions. Uh, not that the universities uh, maybe are not assisting. They are probably doing the best they can, but maybe it couldn't maybe um, be good enough. Maybe they, they might not reach you as an individual researcher, maybe fast enough as you'd wish them to. So the best thing you can do is maybe, okay, say, okay, from my salary, I can use maybe $100 to buy these regions. And then so that you can do something with your students and then life goes on. So um, it's really that kind of a picture that uh, we have. But uh, things are going on. Uh, things are being done, uh, little things building up, and maybe something big is going to come up. So yeah, that's the picture that I just wanted to show. 
It is, inc it is incredible, especially when you've just said as well, you know, to use my own salary. And if there's anybody in the call, you know, for people, people from, for instance, like the United Kingdom, and they're hearing that, that I would have to use my salary to buy, to buy a reagent. That's just not, that's not something. One as well, I don't think we'd be allowed to do it. So pretty sure we get a knock on the door from some police probably, especially for chemistry. Um, but it's just totally not, not heard of. And Andrew, you said as well um, about the grants, you would team together with people, you try and look to see what's perhaps even like overseas. So for both of you, what about the likes of collaborations? How do collaborations strengthen your your work do they strengthen your work and where do you see these sorts of collaborations going where is it going to take either you yourself your laboratory your your country where is it going to take you so i was going to say cedric why don't you get started off on that one so um since i am a synthetic chemist i have zero knowledge on biological assays so for me it's mandatory that i have uh, at least one collaborator willing to perform the biological assays even for malaria for leishmaniasis or for cancer or for any other disease that i want to i want to do some kind of researching so i of course, I was lucky enough to be in the state of Rio de Janeiro, really close to the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation uh, or Firecruz, that is maybe one of the uh, worldwide reference centers for uh, research in uh, the tropical diseases. So uh, we had a lot of co collaborations going on with uh, researchers at the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation, especially for uh, anti-parasitic assays. So this is something that worked really well. The Oswaldo Cruz Foundation, they are funded by the Ministry of Health, not the Ministry of Education, as I was in Brazil. So they have a they are an exclusive and unique uh, funding pipeline. And they were uh, somehow, it was more reliable for them to get funding from the Ministry of Health than for us, for, from the Ministry of Science and Technology or the Ministry of Education. And they were very willing to do collaborations with other institutions because for them it was very important to show to the Minister of Health that they were trying to engage in collaboration with several other scientists around the state of Rio de Janeiro and around the country. So we, and since they we were so really close, it was uh, 25 kilometers away, maybe no. Uh, 35 kilometers away from the main campus of the uh, Oswaldo Cruz Foundation, we could uh, send our uh, grad students to the foundation so they could be a part of the biological things. They could assist or they could perform some of the tests. And for them, that opportunity was unique in the sense that they could get the whole design, synthesize, test, evaluate cycle in MedCam. So they could be a part of the all the, the all, all the steps in the cycle. And they could uh, really understand what was going on uh, uh, in the biological assays. So, so for them, that experience was very, very, very important. Mm -hmm. And Andrew, I was going to say, how does that relate to you? So your collaborations, what, is that something that is is a similar experience for you or is it something that perhaps it's not 35 kilometers down the road and you know you've got to travel i mean i've been to malawi there's quite a distance between the two major cities so you know how does that relate to you so yeah uh collaboration uh, is quite similar to how civic uh, has experienced it but <clears throat> i just wanted to to also include an aspect of maybe um, apart from knowledge transfer from maybe people who know something more than we do, we also have maybe some uh, sometimes um, transfer of skills. Uh, we don't know perhaps how to analyze some pieces of, of maybe spectra data, maybe some spectra. We are not so good at that. Someone else is very good at that, and they come in, they assist us, and then together we can find. Uh, maybe some results or interpretation that we couldn't have done that uh, on our own. So we have been in a position to collaborate with people from different universities within the country, as well as other people from other um, uh, universities outside the country. Uh, for example, um, 
uh, currently in sub one of the projects that we're doing uh, in um, uh, um, Chacoma. We are working on some um, research on Chacoma drug discovery, but we are just focusing on computational uh, methods. So um, you find that we are working with people from um, Midlands University in Zimbabwe. They are very, very good at that. They can do uh, empty simulations. They can do quite a lot. And what we've done is we have, apart from progressing with this, the projects, we have been in a position to learn how to do some of those analysis. So uh, collaborations, they are really working. They are really producing um, very, very good uh, fruits uh, that I think can help us uh, further our research going forward. And so it's good because so both of you are saying that you know you've you've got access to collaborators whether it be uh, in country or whether it be outside and they are helping to fill the knowledge gap that you don't necessarily possess so that's that's nice as well that you can find these collaborators who are willing obviously to collaborate on a very similar unmet need that you're working towards in drug discovery so that's that's really good so because you're both chemists i wanted to ask you a little bit about your labs so the labs that you you've both come from Okay, Cedric, and we're here now, but let's just still imagine that we're still back in Brazil. But so how does your lab differ, shall we say? Um, so, for instance, Andrew, you're working with natural products and Cedric spoke earlier about the use of a fume cupboard. So for the people in the audience, a fume cupboard is something that protects the chemist from any nasty solvents or reagents that they may be using by filtering out. So sucking in air from the lab and filtering through processes before it uh, uh, gets itself out to the atmosphere. So it protects the chemist from their work that they're doing. So, for instance, Andrew, do you have a fume cupboard? Yeah, we have a fume cupboard. Um, but then that, the question would be, how does it work? So, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> yeah, we we really have the fume cupboard, but um, um, because maybe of lack of maybe continuous usage, um, so there are some of the tools that we have, but because they are not used quite often, there are a few people that are capable of using them. Um, so you find that maybe they are dusted, maybe some are broken down. Maybe the pipes, the tubings are not uh, working. Uh, maybe people are not so very much interested in saying, okay, maybe the fan is broken down. Let's rush and rectify it because they say, okay, we can spend man money on that. But then how many people are using it? You find that maybe the cost benefit analysis, uh, it could be a loss. So um, we have the film cupboards, uh, but because the focus is so much on traditional uh, able medicine and maybe natural product research, um, our lab is not so much equipped for synthesis, um, uh, synthetic research. So we, we have mostly manual, uh, manually um, uh, operated on uh, tools, such as maybe glass columns, um, and maybe mostly just glassware, and maybe camping stands, and just a few other tools that are just there for us to help us to analyze maybe the data that we are obtaining. So it's not so much equipped for synthesis but they can easily be adjusted uh, according to need. Uh, so you need to make sure that you put a notice uh, anyone else who don't come here because maybe they're as protected as you should be in, a, in a, an actual synthetic, synthetic lab. So that's the kind of lab that uh, we have. Yeah, no, so uh, when you said about the, the broken, it's a, it's a vicious cycle. If it's broken, nobody's going to use it, which means nobody wants to fix it because not everybody are are using it. And Cedric, is this something that you've experienced, that there's there's quite a lot of, of broken instruments or instruments that don't quite work and nobody uses them as a result, so they just they sit there? Yeah, sometimes we have the way... Uh, grants are organized in Brazil, mostly because of several years of, how can I say that, mis, uh, uh, funds mismanagement by part of some researchers that made the, the granting agencies became very wary and afraid of giving money to scientists. So the level of scrutiny 
around the scientists is very high. And sometimes the, the laws are so tight that, let us say, for example, uh, I remember once the university, we wanted to buy a high resolution mass spec. And we needed, uh, we had a, co uh, a quotation that would cost around uh, more than 1 million Brazilian reals. That's uh, that's a lot of money, maybe more, a little bit more than uh, 180,000 pounds or something like that by today's currency. And then the when the grant was approved after six months, uh, two things happened. One, the uh, Brazil Brazilian real dollar exchange rate has changed, so the equipment was more expensive, and the granting agency had just approved half of what we have asked for, and they wanted us to buy the same equipment but for half of the price. And then somebody had to they try to reason with the granting agency saying, okay, this is impossible. We have, this is not a car sale. This is not um, um, a Christmas, uh, a Boxing Day sale in which or a clearance from a department store that has to make way for the new clothes. So the old clothes, everything must go. No, this is not the way it happens. We cannot just get to to, to Agilent Technologies and ask for a high resolution spec for half of the price. No, that's impossible. And then in the end, we had to return the money half because we got just half and we had no way to buy it. But we have, and also if you, um, ask for money in a in a grant in Brazil, and you ask for you have to specify what the money is being used for. Is to buy reagents? Is to buy equipment? Is to make repairs? And once the uh, money allocations are approved, you cannot change anything. So uh, normally a project uh, grant proposal takes more than six months to being approved. So maybe you when you ask it for the money. All your equipments are running well. When the grant is approved, something is broken and you cannot fix it because the money you had was approved to buy new reagents and to buy new equipment, not to fix old ones because they are different categories of in a budget allocation. So you cannot transfer money from one to the other. Everything is tightly frozen in its place. So is that the it, same? Sorry, Cedric. Is that same for you, Andrew, as well? That you will also have these allocations, and if something breaks, but the grant didn't specify for the repair and upkeep, it was to purchase something new. You you won't be able to to fix that machine. Exactly, and because of delays, maybe the progress is slowed down, and most of the times you don't have a way around it. So it's a little, really a challenge. So you have to talk to maybe the, the the funder and see if they can give you maybe some allowance on that. But yeah, it really happens. Well, it's a shame because you've got a perfectly good instrument for both of you. Perfectly good instrument. It's just broken, but you you don't have the correct funds to to allow you to to fix it. But to buy a new one, um, you do. So that's. That's quite a challenge as well to overcome as well. So drug yes. discovery is proven to be it's 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 hard. I mean, it's hard for anybody. It's not just hard for you guys. It's also hard for us. You know, it's a it's a really difficult field to work in, and like, knowing like if, where you both have your have your labs, you know. What made you want to do drug discovery? Probably a, a really hard discipline to do, knowing the challenges you face. Why do you do what you do? And either one of you can start me off on that one. Andrew started to open his mouth, so you crack on, Maybe Andrew. <laughs> I, I can jump into that already. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, it's true that we we really have the challenges around us, and we knew that maybe um, the environment wouldn't be so much good or maybe conducive for drug discovery, but everything has a starting point. So maybe the environment is like this because maybe there was no one, or maybe there were just a few people who are doing that. What if we jump in, we increase the numbers, 
so that people would know, would, would be in a position to know or see that something is happening in this type of way. And maybe from that, from there, we could begin maybe influencing some maybe government officials to see that, okay, there's a need here, there's an activity here, uh, there, there could be some benefits that we can fund or we can support, not just monetarily, but in many other ways, they can just uh, support us. So yeah, it was on that basis that, okay, we could be there breaking grounds. We might not be the ones to produce maybe that um, uh, that molecule that everyone else would be wowed at, but we could be people who are just breaking the grounds and maybe five years from now, 10 years from now, the story will be different because of uh, maybe the foundations we are setting today. So on that basis, we carry on. That's good. That's, that's, that's a beautiful answer, actually. It's really good. Um, yeah, good luck, Cedric, topping that one. <laughs> I don't believe I can, but let me <laughs> let, let me try. It. But I, I I will shoot it anyway. So while I was finishing my my pharmacy school, I had one uh, pharmaceutical chemistry. Uh, course and the professor was talking about the how drugs were discovered and why and why do you need to make new drugs and how to use some strategies to design and develop new drugs by the way this is this was the beginning of the 2000s i am kind of old by the way i would not say my with my full year uh, this is not the case here but in the beginning of the 2000s, the situation for neglected diseases was really dire. We had old drugs, few drugs, most of them, they were not 100% uh, efficacious. And some diseases we could manage the patient, but without having any kind of uh, expectancy of curing. For example, for uh, sleeping sickness, back in the 2000s, we had a very dire situation. We had the only drug that could uh, affair, be effective in stage two sleeping sickness would kill 5% of all the patients taking it. Melazoprol, and that is by any chance? Melazoprol, by the way, yes. And the other drug that was considered a miracle drug, a flornitin, was being discontinued because it was developed for cancer. And the company that made the fornitin, uh, the cancer trials have failed. So the company, okay, we are not going to produce this anymore because it's not going to work for cancer. So it were, we are uh, uh, shutting down the, the production plants. So there was a desperate run trying to secure uh, some kind of agreement with the company to make, keep them uh, making a flourishing so the patients could benefit of it. So Maya, the professor of medicinal chemistry was talking about the situation and that really struck a nerve in me. Okay, I want to, I want to do this. So this is why I ended up doing grad school and trying to design, dr design drugs for leishmaniasis at the time. I went to Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. Uh, in the foundation, uh, the foundation is also a hospital. So they treat patients with leishmaniasis there. And I asked, okay, I, um, how is the treatment for leishmaniasis? Then the researcher that was hosting me, okay, we can take you there and you can see it for yourself. And that experience changed my, changed my life. Because one thing is you talking about leishmaniasis, this is a neglected disease. It affects a population in Brazil. Other thing is to see the patients having to stay three, four, five hours in the hospital, uh, getting a slow infusion of a sodium uh, stable gluconate, which, by the way, an anti-money drug, but it's still the drug, drug of choice in Brazil because it's one of the most effective, and having to wait there and to lose their the full day of work because they have to stay in the hospital receiving a drug. So it could be doing better and that was one of the motivation factors for me no it's i mean it's also a very good answer as well cedric and it's something that perhaps some scientists haven't actually had the exposure to as well you know a lot of yes a lot of universities are tied up with uh, a hospital there's often an academic teaching hospital close by but 
especially with the neglected diseases, for instance, in the UK, I mean, malaria, and it's it's not something we have a lot of here. It's something that people have brought over from their travels. But you you guys in your, your scenarios, you are suffering from these and you get to see firsthand of what happens. Well, this might have been, this might change in a few years, Lauren. Due, yeah. uh, thanks, thanks to the global warming, there is a study from the Imperial College in London that London might be seeing some dengue fever epidemics in the future because it will be warm enough for the dengue mosquito to cross the channel. And yeah, yay. I heard that as well. <laughs> I know, I heard that as well. So everybody work on neglected diseases. But I mean, without without you guys, I mean, everybody, a drug discovery is a massive, massive collaborative discipline, if it were. It encompasses so many different scientists from so many different backgrounds to be able to create that one drug. And as Andrew said, you know, you may not be that person who makes that one drug or in Andrew's words, the wow, like you don't go wow with it. But I was going to say each one of us, no matter how small you think your role is in it, there is a greater effect that's going to come out as a reward. So whether that be to another scientist, whether that be to to like one of the diseases, you know, you are making a contribution with what you have. And by the sounds of it, both of you have done incredibly well with what you've got. You've made as much use as possible with the materials, the resources, the infrastructure that you have. Yes, there are challenges. There are many challenges. There's probably a lot more than what we have at the Welcome Centre, but you guys are doing something about it. You're trying to you're trying to make it work for you. And Andrew, I think it was really nice as well that you had said that. You know, there's the, you know, if you looked years ago, there was maybe only a couple of us. And, and now that the word is spreading, now people are becoming aware of drug discovery, especially as well. So for people in the audience, Andrew has also written some articles for the general public in Malawi about drug discovery and what it does and how it's similar to traditional medicines. And don't be afraid of it. So please do give Andrew's name a little wee type in Google and I'm sure you'll find it. Um, but it's nice that you're saying, you know, to encourage the next generation to get more people involved in it. And then if more people get involved, there will be more rewards could potentially be in the way of money or potentially you find that person who will fix that machine for you. They just know how, like fixing a car. They just all of a sudden know how to do it. Pretty sure that's not how mass spectrometry works, but we can all live in hope. But no, I was going to say that was that was very, very enlightening. Um, so, Andrew. For, for the final the final bit of of today's today's talk um what would you like to see that happens in the next 10 years in your in your country what would you like to see malawi achieve so in the next 10 years um there could be a lot of things that uh, come to my mind that i'd like to see my country achieving um but most primarily, I would love to see um, drug discovery research being one of the priorities um, for maybe for the government and for uh, also um, partners that we have uh, that come to assist our country. So if you're looking at maybe um, budgetary allocation for research, that portion, uh, at least some good portion, has to be going to drug discovery research. Because uh, you know, as as a country and as a continent, we are one of the places um, that are so much burdened by disease. And to put disease um, as one of our priority targets to work against, drug discovery has to be uh, one of the primary activities that have has to be the forefront. So that's what I'd love to see. Andrew, you should be like a politician or something yeah. that, that gives a beautiful answer. I can't see. We've lost you. No. 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 It's still not hitting you, Lauren. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But now, now you, now you're back. Okay. Slight misfunction with my headphones, but it's all good. <laughs> 
Cedric, why don't you take us off with where you see Brazil in the next 10 years? Uh, okay, I try not to get angry when I answer that. Um, be gentle, be kind. Thank you very much. Um, the, we should have learned one big lesson from the pandemic that we failed to learn in my country, to the, how important science is. My country reaped the benefits of science because our country was able to mass produce one of the coronavirus vaccines in the country because we had the expertise, we had scientists, and we had uh, infrastructure to do so. But at the same time, the same government that bought those vaccines and the technology transfer agreements, such, for example, Fiocruz, the Vladimir Foundation was producing the AstraZeneca uh, slash Oxford vaccine, and the Putantan Institute in Sao Paulo was producing the CoronaVac, a Chinese vaccine as well, on the country because we had the technology for that. And that came because we invested so much in science in the past. But at the same time, the same government uh, began a massive campaign, a disinformation campaign trying to undermine the value of researchers, professors, public universities and scientists because we refused to abide to their ideology and their way to see the world and to judge things. We look at the, the evidence first, and then we then we take our conclusions. From then is other they have the conclusions first, so they want to temper the evidence so the evidence can match their facts. It's, this is not the way the science work. So we have we have been going under a lot of attacks in the last four years. I would like to see them, my country, respecting scientists again and seeing the value of having, because if we we didn't do well in the pandemic, nearly 700,000 Brazilians died in, 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 the, in the last two years, 80% of those deaths, deaths could be avoidable if we had followed the science. We did not, and then we paid the price. And I wish that we could learn the lesson and try to respect and to hear our scientists more because we, even if we don't have the resources, even if we don't have the very big infra infrastructure that we have here in Scotland, with the little that we have, we are able to work miracles. And I don't know that this is not a very scientific word, but I don't have other words to explain what we are able to do with the so little we have. Imagine if we have the resources and the public support and the public funding to do that. We Brazil could be a shining star in science, not just for the, the to the South America, but to the whole world. We have what it takes. We know how to do science. We don't have. To, we just don't have the means for it. And I wish that we could have that. Well, since I, I wish both of your countries, so both Malawi and Brazil, I wish them all the best or in the future. And I hope that they do achieve what, what you what you hope that they will achieve. And I think I think there'll be a good chance they will. So I wanted to say thank you very much to uh, Andrew and very much to Cedric for taking time out of your day to have a chat with us. Uh, I want to say thank you very much to everybody who is listening as well. Um, thank you very much. If you've got any questions, you can feel free to post them in the chat. If not, as I can say, take a look at our uh, website, the CARE website, and you can have a look to see who are the people involved and maybe read a little bit more about these neglected diseases and, for instance, where Andrew and Cedric have both come from. And I want to say as well, thanks again for everybody in the background at CARE who's helped set up uh, these meetings and advertised and it's thanks to the welcome that we can we can host these great so thank you very much everybody thank you very much andrew thank you very much cedric thank you lauren thank you andrew nice to talking to you again thank you lauren and cedric and everyone uh, it's been great talk to you thank you very much <laughs>